Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Harm Reduction 101. My name is Chelsea Boyd, and I'm a fellow in the Integrated Harm Reduction Policy Area at the R Street Institute, and I'll be moderating the panel today. The historical definition of harm reduction centers around a public health philosophy aimed at minimizing the negative health, social, and legal aspects associated with drug use. Today, most harm reduction programs still focus on the risks associated with illegal drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. But because the ultimate goal of harm reduction is to provide practical, non judgmental care tailored to individuals' circumstances and goals, the approach has far broader public health utility. In fact, each and every one of us applies harm reduction principles in our everyday lives, from wearing seatbelts and masks to using hand sanitizers and getting vaccines, we've all engaged in harm reduction. Before we begin the panel, I'd like to take a moment to share our street's approach to integrated harm reduction. When we talk about integrated harm reduction, we envision a reality where all harm reduction strategies are embraced and promoted. We believe that if you support harm reduction for one risky behavior, you should support it for all risky behaviors. Whether an adult smoker is trying to quit through the use of reduced risk tobacco products like vapes or protecting themselves through safer sex practices with increased condom use and medication to prevent HIV. An integrated approach to harm reduction acknowledges the overlaps between historically siloed issues. Chief among them are comorbidities among populations served. For instance, someone suffering from mental health issues may equally suffer from substance use. A shared goal of reducing health disparities and a commitment to providing a practical public health solution that accepts, supports, and even promotes individual autonomy is what we're after. In today's panel, we want to share with you the breadth of potential harm reduction applications, dispel some of the myths that you may have heard about this public health approach, and share stories of how harm reduction can change lives. Now I'd like to introduce you to our panel of harm reduction experts. First is Damon L. Jacobs. He is a New York-based licensed marriage and fa family therapist and HIV prevention specialist who works, who focuses his work on health, love, and passion and pleasure. Through his clinical work, Damon has helped hundreds of couples and individuals create joyful and peace peaceful relationships. He is also the author of the books Rational Relating and Absolutely Should List. He is best known for championing the, championing, championing the use of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP through his work on social media, newsprint, broadcast appearances, is, and was featured as one of, 30, of the 35 leading HIV activists by The Advocate Magazine, one of the top 10 influential voices in HIV and AIDS for 2016 by Healthline Magazine, part of the HIV Heroes series through Metro Source Magazine, and one of the 10 most captivating voices of 2014 by HIV Equal. He was honored to receive a Commissioner Special Recognition Award through the New York State Department of Health in 2016. His trainings have helped thousands learn practical skills for successfully implementing PrEP and increasing adherence. Next, we have Lisa Ravel who grew up outside of Chicago, Illinois and graduated from DePaul University with a degree in communications and a minor in women's studies. Lisa is the executive director of the Harm Reduction Action Center, a public health agency that works with people who inject drugs. Lisa has been, the HRAC, been at the HRAC since 2009. Lisa's activist voice was cultivated with her experiences as an overnight homeless shelter coordinator development work at a domestic violence agency and a former campaign manager for a CA, County Superior and, and AmeriCorps Vista and at the AIDS agency. Lisa is the secretary of the board of directors for the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition. In 2014, Lisa won the Pub Colorado Public Health Association Award for Excellence in Policy, and in 2018 won the Recovery Ally of the Year Award for Advocates for Recovery Colorado. Next is Dr. Pritika C. Kumar, in, and she's a senior fellow in R Street's Integrated Harm Reduction Program area. 
She has experience in areas spanning from sexual and reproductive health to mental health and from infectious diseases to substance use. She has worked in multilateral organizations such as the United Nations and the World Bank, engaged in for-profit and not-for-profit sectors, been involved in integrated health systems and conducted academic research. Within the broader context of harm reduction, Pritika's research interests include social determinants of health, social norms, social capital, social networks, health disparities, and equitable access. Her doctoral and postdoctoral work focused on the role of social capitalism or social capital in harm reduction from a social network perspective. And last but certainly not least is Brendan Cox. Beginning his 23-year career in law enforcement as a patrol officer with the Albany Police Department, he rapidly advanced through the ranks and became a detective sergeant in the Children and Family Services Unit. He subsequently served as a lieutenant in special operations before he returned to the Family and Children's Service Unit as a detective lieutenant. In 2006, he became a commander and oversaw the detective division. In 2008, he was promoted to assistant chief in charge of operations, and a few years later, he was promoted to deputy chief and was appointed chief of police in 2015. Under Chief Cox's leadership, the Department of Justice recognized the Albany Police Department as one of the top 15 police departments in the country as part of the COPS Advancing 21st Century Policing Initiative. He oversaw the implementation of a groundbreaking law enforcement assisted diversion, also known as LEAD initiative, which gives officers more new tools to address crime related to drug addiction, mental health, poverty, and homelessness. In 2017, Chief Cox retired from policing. He is the director of policing strategies at the LEAD National Support Bureau now. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists to start with our set of questions. So first, uh, can you briefly tell us what harm reduction means to you, how you got into the field, and explain what the approach looks like in practice? And we will start with Lisa. Thanks so much for having me today. My name is Lisa Rayville. I'm the Executive Director of the Harm Reduction Action Center here in Colorado. Um, so we have prevention over here, we have treatment over here, we have the criminalization of drug users here. All I'm simply going to talk about today is the life in the middle. In a very magical world, there'd be no drugs, but we live here, and there's one safe thing that folks can do today. And I think many of us can agree that if stigma, shame, and incarceration worked with drug use, we'd have wrapped this up a long time ago. All that does is drive use underground, where people have gotten preventable chronic diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C, and diet of overdose, so we're doing something different right? Reduces the harms associated with X. Today, we're talking in relation to drug use. Abstinence is a friend of harm reduction. It's just simply not a requirement. We're rooting for you because there's something positive and healthier and safer you can do today, right? Um, Dylan Stanley out of Ohio said it best, harm reduction is no place for ego. It's a place to forget what you think you know and set aside your opinion. So when you meet people where they're at, you can take the time to ask them where they want to go, right? How can I support you for a healthier and safer you today? And people who use drugs and people who inject drugs need to be a part not only of harm reduction organizations and all the programs and policies being designed by them, but also volunteering and working at these agencies. Um, I've been with uh, the director for the last 12 years of our 19 years here in Denver. Um, I came from an aid service organization in California about 14 years ago uh, in Monterey County that had a syringe access program, so they let me volunteer there. At the same time, my husband and I were unhoused for seven months, so that's kind of uh, where all of that was able to intersect. Um, for us here at the Harm Reduction Action Center in Denver, what I like is being in the capital too, but we do four main things. First and foremost, direct service, right? Syringe access, access to naloxone or Narcan, people who use drugs are the true first responders in the midst of this overdose crisis. They need to have access first and foremost. Fentanyl testing strips, testing, resources and referrals, community engagement, right? So street outreach in high drug traffic areas, health education, uh, litter cleanup. There's a lot of litter bugs in town. Uh, the third thing we do is advocacy and policy. We believe the streets should influence the policies at the state capitol and with Denver City Council. We've passed seven pieces of statewide legislation in the last 12 years, four to reduce the harms associated with overdose, three to reduce the harms associated with syringe criminalization, and have done three Denver City policy changes, one of them pushing forward with overdose prevention sites. Uh, we are in the worst overdose crisis we've ever seen. 
And then the fourth thing we do is technical assistance with bureaucratic institutions in which our folks intersect with daily, such as neighborhood associations, law enforcement, healthcare providers, parole and probation. So that's just a little snapshot about us. Thank you. I will have Pritika go next. Thank you for that question, Chelsea. Um, I'll first go with what I believe harm reduction is has been for me. It's for me, it is uh, translating the values of um, meeting people where they are, uh, values of compassion, being non-judgmental, and translating those into offering hard strategies and resources and tools to people um, to mitigate the harms from the various behavior choices people make. Um, I started my career as a frontline mental health professional and over my over the span of my 20 year uh, career, uh, whether it has been as um, uh, as a global public health uh, worker um, at the UN or at the World Bank or within uh, integrated health systems uh, or as a regulatory scientist uh, within uh, the tobacco industry, I have seen when we offer people choices. Um, to mitigate the risks from their choice, uh, from their uh, behaviors, um, uh, rather than pushing them into a cycle of stigma and shame. Uh, it works way better when you offer them choices versus pushing them into the cycle of stigma and shame that comes from setting this gold standard of complete abstinence or, or uh, quitting um, their behavior completely. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Pritika. Uh, Brendan, would you like to go next? Yeah, so good afternoon. Thanks, Chelsea. I appreciate that. So, I mean, for me, you know, I started in law enforcement and, and you know, I think like a lot of folks that, that started law enforcement, we certainly take the job because we want to help folks. And that's the number one reason why I've always heard of folks. That's why I went into the job and I never hired anybody that didn't say that they weren't taking the job to, to help folks out. And I think we come into law enforcement with this thought that punishment and coercion are the things that are going to make folks change and that we can arrest somebody and that's going to lead to them getting in front of a judge and say, yes, I did this, it was wrong. And somehow that's going to make behavior change. And what I learned uh, early in my career was that that's not the fact of what's going to make folks change and that we actually have to look at the human being and realize that we're actually causing more trauma and harm to folks when we arrest them and think that we're going to coerce them to do something different. And not only actually harming that person, but harming their family and the community as well. So for me, I got an opportunity to be the, the kind of point person, although I, I don't know that it was an official point person, but the, uh, the unofficial point person for the department when syringe exchange came to Albany. And I got to sit down with some folks that were much more intelligent than I was to really kind of learn a little bit more about what folks struggle with when they struggle with substance, substance use disorders and folks really that have been through a lot of trauma in life and, and are using and aren't ready to stop using. And the fact that we're not enabling anybody when we're actually just giving folks access, access to services that they, they desperately need and that we're actually looking at the humanistic point of this. So once I saw syringe access and once I got a better understanding of what that was, I really was able to, to, to have folks really show me a different world, something that I didn't understand, but thankfully I've come to understand a lot more. And to me, harm reduction is really about building that relationship and about recognizing that um, we need to have a person-centered approach and we need to take stigma out of things. And we need to take our own views out of this and put our views aside because really most of our laws, especially laws around substance use, come out of uh, morality that quite frankly uh, doesn't make a lot of sense um, and that we have to actually take shame and stigma out of this. And we need to look at the individual and treat the individual in a much more public health framework than a criminal legal framework. And what we've done in LEAD in a lot of ways is we've just gotten around the law by saying if, the, if, if our lawmakers aren't going to change the laws, then we'll change the way we approach things. So folks that are committing violations that are uh, law violations that are driven by addiction or driven by mental health or by the fact that they're living in poverty or homeless, you know, we can do something different. And that approach can be much very much based on that individual need rather than what we think they need, actually sitting down with that person, gaining their trust, understanding what they need and addressing what they need in that fashion. So, you know, I've been lucky to have enough folks uh, educate me so I can understand a little bit better about how uh, human beings actually change as opposed to how I think I can make them change. So look forward to uh, the rest of the panel. Thank you. And Damon? Hey. 
Okay, well, thank you. Uh, what a great panel, Chelsea. And thank you everyone at R Street for putting together this panel. Uh, I wanna start kind of in the opposite of what you said. First, I wanna say like how I came into harm reduction. I came into harm reduction because I was studying psychology in the Bay Area in the early 1990s and the community, my community was dying. Um, I was living in the Castro at a time when you knew people who had AIDS who died of AIDS. Um, I had roommates, friends, colleagues, teachers, students, um, co-workers who were dying of AIDS. And it seemed that if there was something to be done, if there was a mental health issue to be addressed, it had to be done in the framework of helping people have better choices and support in reducing harm. And that's kind of how I came into harm reduction 30 years ago. Um, when I started learning about safer sex education in 1991, throughout that time, um, a lot has changed in the landscape of LGBTQ issues. Um, but of course, when people are traumatized, when people have lost their community, when they've lost their friends, what do they do? Generally, they turn to drugs or alcohol or some kind of escape. So it was, again, through that paradigm of saying, how do I help my community learn tools to survive and thrive? Um, and still enjoy a quality of life that matters to them. And what I have really learned in this whole 30 years throughout this, and as well as with the biomedical advancements in PrEP and U equals U, and I can explain what those are. People don't know what those are. But what I've come to really understand clearly in 30 years is that people want to have maximal pleasure with minimal risk. They want to have more sexual connections with fewer barriers, and they want to have heightened physical sensations with lower risk. So instead of contradicting that, instead of stigmatizing that, instead of judging that, my work and the people I've worked with have been very much about promoting celebratory connection and helping people learn the, the safest, most pleasurable ways to live their lives based on their values, their terms, um, and hopefully to increase and enhance. And again, harm reduction is such a general term. Um, a year and a half ago, it really got turned on its head because harm reduction a year and a half ago was like, well, how do I go to the grocery store and not get COVID? And it's been such a very, very different approach, but it's one that I think everybody could benefit from if they think about these basic principles we're all talking about here is helping people live their lives reasonably and rationally and meaningfully while avoiding risk at the same time. And I, that, I think that conversation is not happening. Uh, at least not in this country, when it comes to um, surviving and fighting the COVID epidemic that we're still in. Thank you, everyone, for those great introductions to harm reduction and to your uh, individual work. So some people think that harm reduction can only help people who use illicit drugs. How can providing a range of harm reduction services help the populations that you work with? Uh, let's have Damon and then Brendan discuss. Great, thank you, Chelsea. So, so again, for me, a lot of my work has been in the realm of drugs and helping people use drugs with less risk, but also really within the sexual realm, um, especially because HIV and AIDS was really a, a lethal disease prior to 1996 and in many areas still is. So it wasn't just about this idea of like harm reduction and drugs, it was about connection. It was about resolving loneliness and building community and trust and dealing with trauma in a way that didn't further injury and, and, and devastation and further trauma. So again, I really think of this term in a very general way. In more recent years in my work with R Street, I've learned a lot about helping my community reduce harm related to nicotine consumption. Given that um, uh, nicotine and smoking and smoking combustibles in the LGBTQ community is about double that of the non-LGBTQ population. And that people living with HIV now today are more likely to die of lung cancer if they smoke than of HIV itself. So given that, how do we help people make these decisions? If someone's still going to smoke or if they can't quit nicotine, okay, what do vaping devices offer? What do gums or patches offer? Really widening the spectrum be beyond what the medical establishment would traditionally teach in the US to help people make these decisions. Um, again, not just related to nicotine or alcohol, um, but for drugs and alcohol, for smoking. And again, now we're talking about COVID. Like, how do I get on a plane? How do I see my family? How do I go on vacation? How do I go to the grocery store and not put myself in imminent risk in this new COVID world we're all living in? I can say so much more, but I'm gonna stop there. 
Go ahead, Brendan. So yeah, I think you know one of the great things that that we've been able to evolve with LEAD is to not only address folks with substance use disorders, but folks that have mental illness and folks that are living in poverty and homeless. And I think one of the things that our case managers do an awesome job with is working with folks to meet them where they're at and really help them to address many issues by building those relationships and trying to figure out how to how to really get folks to be able to access services that they aren't normally able to. So folks, whether it's a mental illness or it's somebody living in poverty, um, you know, it's, there are barriers that are in place that should never be in place for folks to get access, whether it's to social services, whether it's to a program or housing and a waiting list to get into different things. And folks get um, very frustrated with those services and folks get um, to a point where they're not comfortable going into certain places. And what our case managers do is they find different alternative ways to get them connected and they find ways to build a relationship and trust where many times they're, they're helping them walk through that door to get them reconnected. And we see this across the country where it's somebody, I'm not gonna go to social services. I'm not walking through the magnometer. I'm not gonna deal with this waiting an hour and a half in the lobby. I'm not going up to this uncomfortable building. You know, I, I feel that this is not the place. And we've got folks struggling through trauma and they're just being re-traumatized. So many times our case managers are finding ways to mitigate those factors and figuring out ways like, hey, could we do something different? Can we not have to do the normal thing of, all of us needing to go through this regular um, set of terms of getting services. Can we, can we try to do this differently? So I think it's a matter of, of really trying to build that trust and trying to figure out ways that we can not look at everything as being the same. I said this to a group the other day, you know, we don't work in factories. We don't work in a factory where we put the same part on the same piece every single time. We're talking about human beings and we have to find different ways to do things. I, I'm a horrible patient. Um, and I consider myself to be pretty able to be able to get out and take care of things on my own. You know, we start adding a lot of different factors in place and it's very difficult for folks to do that. So I think we have been able to do things outside of substance use because we always think about harm reduction and substance use, but in truth, we can use harm reduction in a lot of different ways. And I think we've been able to do that with mental illness and with, with uh, poverty and what we do every day. One of the areas I think we need to improve this on is violence. You know, in today's world, we're talking about a ton of violence across the country, especially gun violence. And I think when we look at our youth, and especially our youth that are marginalized and the amount of violence that they're seeing and they're traumatized on, I don't think we do enough harm reduction with our youth to really talk to them and meet them where they're at and understand all they're going through to figure out what it is we need to address differently. Um, we don't treat those, those, those kids differently in school. We don't try to figure out different programming. We don't figure out a way to make sure that folks that understand those kids are the ones talking to them. And I think we miss a lot of opportunities by not looking at things through the framework of harm reduction. And I think we need to do more work to actually get folks to understand harm reduction better because we could actually use harm reduction as a framework to actually solve some of the violence that we have going on in our cities in a much better, more effective way that actually would be much better for those kids, for those kids that they're only kids and we don't look at them that way. Instead, we just look at them and I won't even say how a lot of folks look at them, but we need to look at those kids as exactly what they are. Young kids that have seen a lot of trauma that are only acting out because of their trauma that they've been through. And instead of looking at through a harm reduction lens about trying to figure out to meet them where they are and not leaving them where they are, but instead finding unique ways to build that relationship and to address those needs. And then maybe we could actually reduce that violence that's in the community. Yes, so hearing a lot about how trauma plays a role in um, how a lot of people live their lives and also how we um, should be treating people um, that addresses that trauma. So this question is for Pritika and Lisa. Um, how have you seen harm reduction change the lives of the populations that you work with? Uh, Pritika, you can go first. All right. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, one story that comes to mind is from years ago when I worked as a volunteer. I was a student researcher uh, at Hopkins, and I used to volunteer for the Baltimore City Syringe Exchange Program. Um, and they had this man that would stand at this, uh, for those of you don't, who don't know Baltimore, there is this stretch in East Baltimore, um, close to the Inner Harbor that's called the Block. And it's a stretch of strip clubs. Um, and, um, and the Baltimore City Syringe Exchange Program used to have a van there every Thursday. And I would be there, I would, I would just hang out, work with them from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. And, um, 
Um, and the work for the syringe exchange program initially was to hand out condoms and, and clean syringes. And I was witness to the amazing work that the syringe exchange program coordinators were doing, not just doing the targeted harm reduction work, but just building trust with the community, whether it was with the dancers, the bouncers, the managers, the clients, uh, breaking ice with them, building trust, building community. And other than handing out the condoms and the, and the clean syringes, if there were folks who were interested in getting into drug treatment, they were helping them get a spot at the drug treatment. Not just that, there were time, we were able to build trust enough that we were able to get into the clubs. And that's a big deal because there's huge amounts of distrust. Um, and once we were able to get into the clubs and talk to the dancers, um, we uh, in my time, we there were a couple of dancers I remember who were pregnant and were still dancing. Um, we were able to get them access to reproductive health care services, so much so that the, the city actually got a second van on the block. And that van had uh, an examination table and had a nurse. And so every Thursday, they could get their reproductive health care uh, checkups. They could get pregnancy tests, HIV tests, flu shots, um, access to basic health care services. So what I really saw was that something that started as a syringe exchange program was actually a gateway to it and an avenue for a lot more than just that. Lisa, you're up. Uh, yeah, so what I love about harm reduction is harm reduction is about life, right? We are in the worst overdose crisis we've ever seen in the United States in Colorado and Denver. And I have the luxury of spending every day with people who inject drugs that come in here. And what is really going on in the last couple of years is frontline service providers in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic are working in the worst overdose crisis we've ever seen. And what we're dealing with is grief. People we know, love and serve are dying of preventable overdoses and we can be doing better, right? So I think you know, for, for us here, harm reduction supports you for healthier and safer you today. What does that look like? Let's cheer about it. And it's not always gonna be treatment. Now, what is the number one substance use treatment and mission requirement? You have to be alive, right? So if you support treatment, you support harm reduction. If you support recovery, you support Narcan, right? But there's all sorts of other things that we can build on successes. It's so much easier to build on successes than being like, you know what you should do? What do you know? How can I support you, right? Sometimes it's, you know, you know, supporting somebody so they don't go to the emergency department anymore, so they use an alcohol pad. We know anytime you break your skin, you're at risk of infection. We know that, you know, having somebody out there rooting for you. We, like law enforcement knows they can't arrest their, they can't arrest their way out of drug use, right? But people who use drugs and healthcare providers have a very tumultuous relationship. So really trying to bridge that access for folks too. If we want to take it out of the criminal justice system, and we're not really seeing the medical system coming, being like, come nestle in my bosom right? So harm reduction's there, right? Harm reduction's there, walking with you for a healthier and safer you, whatever you want to do. And we are rooting for you because we want you to be alive. So, you know, for us, it's, you know, even just getting an ID, like what, what is, what does different look like? And a lot of times people will say, well, I failed treatment. And most of the time, what it looks like is treatment failed you. We don't have a lot of very good evidence-based treatment in the country. We can talk about you know, medication-assisted treatment, which is the gold standard, but inpatient continues to be a story of hope and there's virtually nothing for stimulant users. When 50% of my folks inject meth upon intake, that's an issue. But there's something positive and healthier and safer folks can do today and people can build on that. So yeah, I would say harm reduction is all about life. That's really beautiful, actually, that harm reduction is all about life. Um, and it's true, keeping people alive long enough so that they can um, improve their lives, however they see the need or desire to do so. Um, so the next question, I'm going to go round robin with everyone. And that is, uh, what are the biggest challenges you and your clients or your research participants face in providing and receiving harm reduction services. So we'll go in reverse order this time. So Lisa, you're up again. <laughs> this whole thing again? Uh, I think the biggest issue that I have as an executive director of the largest syringe access program in the state of Colorado is people are coming from a place of misinformation. 
Uh, people who don't know anything about people who use drugs think they know everything about people who use drugs. <laughs> the problem is we don't have a very good media representation of a syringe access program, right? Or even people who use drugs or even how to recognize and respond to an overdose. Most of the time, if it's happening in a movie, they're tossing somebody in the shower. and Nobody's really talking about naloxone. So um, most of what we're trying to do is chip away at that misinformation. The war on drug users has been incredibly racist and classist since forever, but especially since 1971 when Nixon declared it, right? Then we had just say no, then we had dare, then everyone thought incarceration was gonna work. Like we tried your stigma, we tried your shame, we tried your incarceration. And that got us into the worst overdose crisis and the most unpredictable and toxic drug supply we've ever had in the United States. So, um, you know, try harm reduction, it works. I think I'm going to speak to uh, speak about tobacco harm reduction, uh, something that I have been most recently really involved in, and and I think the biggest challenge in tobacco harm reduction is equity. Equitable harm reduction does not exist, uh, and and the lack of access to reduced risk uh, products does not is is completely um, it, it is a, it's a reality. So I would start with a three legged stool of harm reduction, which is availability, accessibility, and affordability. And I feel that all three of them are are, are severely challenged because of where we are in terms of um, in terms of. Um, one of the biggest challenges I feel is the lack of consistent evidence-based uh, messaging. So um, in the last few, I, I can just say that in the last few um, conferences that I've been at, it's, it's a little unfortunate to see advocacy organizations, very well-meaning, very well-intentioned, regurgitating photos from way before the tobacco industry was regulated. And I feel like that does more disservice to, um, to the field of harm reduction than, than anything else. The other thing that I feel is, which is, again, a big obstacle is siloed conversations. I feel like a lot of conversations about tobacco harm reduction happen in silos. There is an exclusionary approach where we exclude some, some people from, from the table. So if we want to have a comprehensive worldview and a fully informed worldview, we need to be more inclusive in having all the voices at the table, uh, like what Brendan said earlier about being person centric. So have the consumers at the table, have the regulators, the tobacco control folks at the table, and also the regulated folks on, at the table. And by that, I mean the manufacturers, the retailers. A lot of times we feel, um, we see that these are the voices that are left out of the table, which, which kind of keeps, only gives you a very lopsided view um, of tobacco. Thank you for that, Pritika. Uh, Brendan? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one thing that we're all fighting against is, and nobody wants to talk about it, but it's a safe supply of drugs. I mean, people don't want to go there, but I'm sorry. You know, I mean, we have people dying every single day. We're trying our best to keep people alive until they're ready, if they're ever ready, if that's what they want to do is, is, is stop using drugs. But we're never going to be able to keep people totally safe unless we actually get a safe supply of drugs and it's accessible to people. And we have to understand that just because there's a safe supply of drugs doesn't mean we're saying everybody should just do whatever they want. And it doesn't mean that we're saying that everybody should just use drugs. It's the same simple fact of the matter is we're all worried about this fentanyl crisis. And until we give people a safe supply of actual drugs, that's what's going to be out there is fentanyl or the worst or, or the next line of things that's even worse. So until we're willing to just step back and actually be adults and recognize that if we give people a safe clean supply of drugs and access to that regulated drug, we can actually reduce those, those deaths through that and address the system that needs to be addressed. We're gonna continue in this spiral and we're gonna to continue to chase our tails. Thank you, and Damon? So in agreement with what everyone's saying, I'm gonna talk about this issue in relation to sexual health and the barriers to sexual health and harm reduction that I've encountered in this country, which is primarily based in morality. 
in the medical community that this idea, so I talk a lot about PrEP. PrEP is, for those who don't know, is a daily pill that someone can take, someone who's HIV negative can use to reduce their risk of acquiring HIV by about 99% if they use it as prescribed. And so you would think that that would have been a cause for celebration and education and information when this was all learned about 12 years ago, and it wasn't. Um, it was held back, the information wasn't being shared by the medical community, and it was up to me and other community activists to get the word out there and to use the message. And the biggest obstacles that we face continue to be providers who do not support this based on their morality because it challenges their views about sexuality, mostly about sexual freedom and what they believe to be in conflict with their moral code, not their medical code. So we're continuously facing this conflict between science and stigma. And when we talk to doctors about this, when we're talking to regulators about this, we encourage them to prioritize the science over the stigma, the medicine over the morality, their evidence over the emotions, the facts over the fears. There will always be fears related to harm reduction. There's always fears about giving people tools to enjoy their lives with pleasure. So people say, well, PrEP prevents HIV, but it doesn't prevent syphilis. You're right. It doesn't prevent syphilis. It doesn't prevent COVID. It doesn't prevent Ebola. It doesn't prevent, it didn't get me out of jury duty either. But it's, it's, it, that's not what harm reduction is about. Perfect is not the enemy of the good. And we face these all or nothing barriers that say, well, if it's not perfect, then it's not good. And we can't help people learn these tools. That is the biggest obstacle I have faced talking about sexual health and sexual freedom. And by the way, this is not new to PrEP. This is not new to HIV. I think women have been fighting this fight for 50 years when it comes to birth control and reproductive rights. You can go back to the 1930s and see in this country that there was resistance to having a cure for syphilis. Again, not because of the medicine, because of the morality that it suggested, the promiscuity and encouraged at the time. So that is such the biggest barrier I have faced to having people be, have access to this information and the tools that can help improve the quality and quantity and pleasure in their lives. Thank you, everybody. Those are really insightful thoughts about um, the challenges that people have really faced in receiving harm reduction services and where we can go um, to help relieve some of those challenges. Um, so what would you say to someone who says that harm reduction enables risky behavior? Is harm reduction at odds with abstinence? And um, we're going to start with Brendan on this one. So, so thanks, I think that's a great question. Um, and that's something, so, so we wound up educating a lot of officers on harm reduction and how harm reduction applies to lead and, and what folks are gonna work with with case management. And a lot of the times what, what I simply do is just talk about like, okay, if we arrested somebody compared to diverting them and getting them to a case manager, simply like, if you arrest them, are they gonna stop using drugs? And thankfully, there's a lot of honest officers who shake their head and they're like, no. So it's like, okay, well then how are we enabling them by getting them access to syringes? How are we enabling them by giving them Narcan? How are we enabling them by not arresting them, by actually getting them access to a case manager and by treating them as human beings and letting them decide what it is that they want to do and how they want to, how do they want to obtain services and what those services are? And I think we need to continue to have those conversations that harm reduction is not enabling anything, that we all make decisions, we all make choices. And sometimes those turn into things like substance use disorders, where now we are ultimately caught up with this addiction, but how that's addressed is something much different, and harm reduction is a different approach to that. But, you know, it's just like there's a bar in every corner. That doesn't now make me automatically, when I go to walk by it, go in and take a shot and then continue to walk down the street. So I think it's just a matter of continuing to educate and getting that out of everybody's head. You know, I, I have two sons. Um, they're 24 and 21. They've heard me say a lot of things, including the statement I just said before. That doesn't mean I tell them to go out and do whatever they want to do. That's, how, that, that, that's telling them, like, we need to educate you as to what's out there, what the dangers are, and you're going to make decisions. But at the end of the day, I don't want you doing this. I want you to stay alive and I want you to stay healthy. But if you do this, at least be educated as to what it is. But I think that when people talk about harm reduction as being an enabling factor in what people's choices are, I think we just need to be adults and talk about what re real life is and what we all have done, too. And that's the other piece of this, like, hey, what have you done in your life? And we'll look at where you are now. So we all have, to, all have to be honest, too, about what we might have done in the past. Thank you. And Damon, you look like you uh, really want to jump in there. 
<laughs> well, I have a true story. So when I talk about prep with doctors or medical professionals, one of the concerns that they say to me is that I'm afraid that if I talk to my patient about pre-exposure prophylaxis prep, and I give them the tool to prevent HIV, that they'll want to have lots of condomless sex, that uh, that'll give them a license to bear back. And my response is, did I need a license? If I don't have one, am I gonna get in trouble now? I've been barebacking without it. So, and, and what? look around the room, look at all of us that are here. How did any of us get here? We got here because someone had sex with someone without protection or that protection didn't work. So clearly we, we don't need a license to bareback. We don't need a license to enjoy sex without condoms. We don't need a license to enjoy sexuality and pleasure. And if we use this naive narcissistic paternalism to try to tell people what they should or should not do with their bodies, we're just get going in conflict with reality. And if you have the solution to trauma, if you have the solution to racism, if you have the solution to the systems that lead to drug use and criminalize, criminalized behaviors, then, then please share with me your magic wand, but you're sure not doing it. So how do you get off telling people what they can and cannot or should or should not do with their bodies? I actually wrote a book about this called Absolutely Should List that you mentioned. And Again, it's just this sort of inherent mind structure that I am an authority figure. I have the right to dictate what other people do with their bodies. And if they don't follow what I tell them to do, well, then there's nothing I can do to help them. And it's their fault if they get sick as a result. I don't subscribe to that. I don't think most people watching this this far would do subscribe to that, but that is still so much the common paradigm that I encounter in the medical community today. Thank you for so passionate um, for being so passionate about everything. That's, we need those voices in the room. Um, and you're a great one, Damon. Um, Lisa, would you like to uh, ring in on this one? Always and forever. Um, they did a great job. I think, you know, we're enabling folks for healthier and safer than today, right? We've already talked about people who don't know anything about people who use drugs, think they know everything about people who use drugs. If you've truly walked with somebody for a healthier and safer than, you would know there's a lot of systems and barriers in place and you just need to be rooting for folks. So again, if you support recovery, you support harm reduction. If you support treatment, you support harm reduction. You support all of that, you support Narcan. Like that's nonsense, give me a call. All right, so for all of the policymakers in the room, um, what is one thing that you wish policymakers knew about harm reduction and what can policymakers do to expand access to harm reduction services? Um, again, we're gonna round Robin and give everyone a chance to answer this one. Pritika, you wanna start? I can only unmute myself. Um, yeah, um, I feel that you know with tobacco harm reduction, I think it is one appeal that I would like to make is, um, is to go beyond the one size fits all, um, you know, argument where, um, and also to acknowledge that there are various stages from initiating a certain behavior to quitting or to have complete abstinence. While, while a few of us can, can you know, um, can aspire to and succeed quitting, Many of us are in between um, in, in, in between that journey. And, and so two things that I would want to kind of leave this, uh, you know, this um, panel with is one is the continuum of risk to know that not all tobacco products are on this are equally harmful. While there is no completely safe tobacco product, but tobacco products are on that continuum of risk where the most um, uh, risky is to smoke and use a, using a combustible uh, tobacco product. And then, uh, of course, the, the gold standard is where someone's able to completely quit. And in between, there are these reduced risk products. Um, so, so to anchor ourselves in the reality that there are 34 million cigarette smokers in the country today, and about half a million um, uh, die every year, um, because of smoking related um, complications. And smoking is still the country's most um, uh, leading cause of preventable um, death and disease. So, so if you're anchored in that fact, um, I feel like we can make um, 
and uh, choices um, regarding policies more, more efficiently. The, the third thing is uh, knowing uh, this thing called the risk cliff. And, and all that I'm saying uh, has, there is scientific evidence behind it, um, even though I passionately believe in it. Um, and so, um, so, so the, the concept of risk cliff is, so you imagine a cliff and the, the, the smoking, which is the most risky, is the riskiest, is the top of the cliff. And when you make a reduced, when you when when a smoker makes a choice to use a re reduced risk product, the delta of the risk is significantly huge. And so, um, uh, so those are some of the things that I'd like to leave this panel with. Yeah, and that's definitely true for more than smoking as well. Um, but that's where we talk about it a lot, uh, particularly with the continuum of risk. Lisa, would you like to ring in with some policy recommendations? So like I said earlier, we believe the streets should influence the policies at the state capitals. Um, it's been, you know, we've, in Colorado, we've had some pretty harm reduction friendly legislators um, and legislators. Um, lean on us, right? Harm reduction has the science, we've got the evidence, we've got the data, babe call, you know, we want to support you too. Harm reduction isn't just for people who use drugs, it's also for policymakers. We are counting on you to chip away at these archaic and racist drug policies that we're having to deal under. And quite honestly, step one is passing the law, steps two through 10 are all about implementation. So that's been really for those frontline organizations is it's one thing to have this really great piece of legislation that passes, but how does it practically get out on the streets? And I can assure you that law enforcement does not want to hear about new law changes for people who use drugs. So it's really important we're getting out there and we're having those conversations too, because I think, you know, especially what Brendan brought up earlier, you know, harm reduction 1.0 is syringe access, naloxone, Narcan, fentanyl testing strip. Harm reduction 2.0 or overdose prevention sites in a safe supply. And I'm really glad that Brendan brought up a safe supply in particular, which would, you know, but right now we have a very unpredictable and toxic drug supply. Um, we've had safe supply in the United States for years and years and years. It's called alcohol. If people were having unpredictable beers, they'd be storming the Capitol, right? So this drug exceptionalism too, when we talk about people who inject heroin and meth and cocaine versus uh, people who drink. Um, we need to be having those larger conversations, but, but let us be supportive because we're, we're relying on you. By the very nature of who we serve, people assume that harm reduction organizations are sketchy or not transparent. So we have to be extra transparent, right? And we really wanna make sure that our folks have better interactions on the streets. And a lot of that is making sure that the you know, paraphernalia isn't criminalized, making sure that people aren't getting you know, jail and incarceration for you know, personal possession or just drugs in general. Like, like we want a healthier and safer community and harm reduction efforts and initiatives increase public safety. That's absolutely true. And I think we're starting to see um, how some of that's coming around with cannabis as we start to see how cannabis legalization um, in various locations are uh, pushing towards a, I guess, safe supply, although we don't necessarily talk about that so much with cannabis. Um, but Brendan, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the law enforcement side? Yeah, you know, I think the, the big thing for me is to not have either new legislation or old legislation continue to be reliant on enforcement and coercion. And I think we have to be very careful about that. I mean, I've seen times where folks are well-meaning and they want to do something in the public health realm, but we put enforcement actions behind it. We even saw it with the pandemic, you know, we're going to put mask mandates in and then we're going to have the police go out and write somebody a ticket if they don't have a mask on. And it's like, wait a second, let's actually come up with an actual harm reduction method and let's go out and do some education and let's bring folks out in the street that have a little bit more knowledge about why we're putting masks on and not have an officer do it with the idea of a ticket or handcuffs behind it, because now we're just going to come into something that's going to spiral down into something we don't want it to. So I think that, you know, the, the impression that I try to give is, let's not have the officers be pawns in this game. The officers have been pawns in the war on drugs for 51 years, longer than that actually, but at least 51 years. So let's take them away from being pawns. You know, I, the officers that I talk to across the country, a lot of times they don't even understand the fact that they've been utilized as pawns in this whole game because it's, well, wait a second, we've always looked at, 
illicit drugs as being bad. And that's why we're here to stop them because we're just keeping really bad things from happening in society because, because of the fact that we haven't looked at the reality of things, that it's not the drug, it's our morality that has ruled the day. So to me, it's legislative bodies need to think before they act and to really make sure that they look at all the different avenues of going and not fall back to punishment and coercion and instead think about other ways to, to ultimately get the enhancements that we're looking to get. Thank you. And Damon? Thank you. I love those answers. You know, I, I love acronyms. So mine here is COYOTE, which for those who don't know is call off your old tired ethics, or at least challenge your old tired ethics. Um, what that looks like, I, I, the other, you know, with ethics also comes politics. And I know we're not talking politics here, but I just, it gets such in the way on all sides of making sensible policy. For example, as was mentioned earlier, tobacco harm reduction. I love the city of San Francisco. I lived there for 10 years. I love San Francisco, but they were on so in front of banning sensible vaping products and flavored products several years ago. Now, let's just go backward. San Francisco was at the lead of syringe exchange, um, healthy needle exchange. That's actually where I learned about harm reduction was when I lived in San Francisco. So they are in favor of providing safe, safer harm reduction um, and needle exchange for people who are using IV drugs. They have been in favor of legalizing marijuana. They were at the very front of providing prep for all the citizens who wanted it for sexual health. Great. But when it comes to providing sensible harm reduction for people addicted to nicotine, boom, brick wall. There was no getting through. There was no changing anybody's mind. And they enforced a policy now, which means that just cigarettes are available. You can't get vaping products in San Francisco. Now you can get cigarettes. How does that make any sense? Well, it doesn't. But in the best that I could decipher from what got in the way of being sensible and logical were the politics, was the perception that vaping products were controlled and being manipulated by right wing tobacco companies. And that sort of stopped the conversation from moving forward in a rational, productive way. I wish we could see less of that in policy decisions. Those are all great suggestions and uh, points about that people can take home to, um, as they're thinking about working with their uh, superiors or working with their um, constituents as well. So we have about eight minutes left. Um, and I would like to ask this question to, uh, we'll start with Damon first. Um, how do harm reduction and co recovery coexist? Well. I think they do coexist. And it, it's not, again, where I think people fall into a trap is when they think it has to be one or the other. Recovery can be a form of harm reduction. And again, when I think of harm reduction, I'm like, okay, well, you go to a 12-step meeting in New York City, a traditional 12-step meeting. Um, if you're going to an in-person 12-step meeting, you are likely going to walk through the sidewalk and see a lot of people outside drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. So they are okay with using coffee or nicotine to control mood regulation, but they are seeking for ways not to allow other drugs, perhaps alcohol or crystal meth or whatever drug, not to ruin their lives. And in that way, they are technically in recovery. Um, I think that's fine. I think that's a mixed model, even though they probably would not call that harm reduction. I say they would because they're still using drugs to change their mind and their mood. So instead of saying recovery, I like to work with my clients in terms of a model of discovery. The problem with recovery is a lot of times people use drugs in alcohol to cover up trauma. And what I like to think about with my clients seeking harm reduction is discovery. Can we not, can we discover what is there, what is the pain, what is the trauma underneath compulsive behaviors that might be hurting you and hurting the people around you. But again, I see all of that under the umbrage of harm reduction, even if it means they're calling it recovery or a type of abstinence. I don't think anyone, if anyone's drunk coffee today, then you're not abstinent. It's a mood altering drug. And what's wrong with that? I'm not giving up my coffee, forget it. <laughs> You I'm not giving up my coffee, coffee either. No, I um, don't think anyone on this call is or um, uh, watching either. Uh, Lisa, do you have any thoughts on this? 
Damon, you did great. I would just say if you support recovery, you support harm reduction and we're besties. We have the necklaces to prove it. Um, it's important. We're continuing to have those conversations and what that looks like. We also know that for some folks, relapse or remission can be a part of recovery. And so, um, you know, we're on the same side. All right. If anyone has any um, last comments or um, thoughts that they'd like to share, um, I would love to hear them really quickly, like in 30 seconds. Um, Damon, looks like you're unmuted. Oh, I always, well, again, I wish this whole COVID situation could have unfolded in the context and framework of harm reduction. I think it, we would have seen a very different result if we had rolled out the idea of masks and vaccines as a, as a qualitative form of harm reduction versus this all or nothing that people are now getting into and unfortunately has been gravely politicized. So that just puts people in opposite corners. But what if from the very beginning they had just said masks won't prevent all COVID, but it's certainly going to reduce harm. It's certainly going to reduce the likelihood of getting COVID and transferring it to others. Vaccines don't stop COVID, but they certainly reduce the possibility of getting COVID and giving it to others. I wish that had been the message from the beginning. I think we could have seen different results if it had. Thank you, everybody. Um, well, we know that the day is starting to get late, so we're going to wrap it up a little bit early. I see that we have one question about whether or not this will be posted online. This will be posted on both Our Streets YouTube and Our Streets website, uh, probably by about Friday. Um, also, we will be following up with attendees with a harm reduction myths uh, handout that you can read through and uh, we'll have the contact information for the Our Street team on the back in case you have any questions. Um, we really thank everyone for being here. We thank our panelists for being here and for lending their excellent expertise. Um, it's been a great discussion and I think that everyone learned a lot and uh, we can see how harm, re harm reduction can really be integrated to uh, form a real comprehensive public health strategy uh, that can reach a lot of different lives. So thank you everyone for attending and thank you to our panelists once again. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks you. For watching.